welcome everyone. That's all, um, how many are there? Let me see, 103 people at the moment for this session. Thanks for looking in. The topic for this session is nature and imagination. And we're delighted to welcome two eminent speakers, Rob Hopkins and Bridget McKenzie. Rob Hopkins is founder of the International Transition Towns Movement and co-founder of Transition Town Totnes and the author of numerous books, including, and I, I've got lots of them in my shelf here, there's one of them. And, and that one's uh, The Transition Companion, Making Your Community More Resilient in Uncertain Times. And his most recent one, which is this one here, and that is From What Is to What If, Unleashing the Power of Imagination to Create the Future We Want. In 2012, he was voted one of the independent's top 100 environmentalists and was included in the observers list of 50 new radicals. Rob holds doctorates degrees at three universities. When he's not doing all this, he's a keen gardener, a founder of New Lion Brewery in Totnes and director of Totnes Community Development Society, an ambitious community-led development project. And if I could ask Rob to speak first. Thank you. Well, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, delightful to, to, to see you all here. Um, I'm just going to share my screen because I'll just show you some pictures to illustrate what I'm going to talk about. Uh, um, 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 so can you see that? Does that work? And you can just see just the main slides, yeah? Good. So hello, I'm Rob Hopkins, and it's my great pleasure to be with you today. And what I want to talk about is about imagination and some work that I've done over the last couple of years that led to the book that George uh, mentioned. And uh, I always want like to try and start with a little bit of what Extinction Rebellion would call tell the truth in terms of where we're at right now. I, I feel like we are at the moment standing on top of this enormous mountain. And beneath our feet is more debt, more anxiety, more carbon, more plastic, more, more uh, um, loneliness than we've ever stood on top of before. And the views are amazing for some, uh, but the expert guides who are at our side are saying, we really need to get down off this mountain really, really quickly. Can you see the storm clouds that are coming in over there? We really need to get down off here. And for some people, that's enough. For some people there that we're, we're, we're uh, happy enough to say, uh, right, you are then uh, let's get down off here really quickly. For a lot of people, I feel like actually a, a lot of what needs to happen right now, because as this drawing shows, if we had started in the 1980s, it would have been so, so, so much easier. And, uh, uh, you know, if, if this was a something that was going to be won by facts and figures and statistics, we would have we would have done this in the 1980s. I, I feel uh, Deborah. Sorry, Rob. Um, one or two people are asking if you can put it into presenter mode because it'd be a little bit larger for them. Presenter. Is that possible? Like, Thank you. Like that. Lovely. That's brilliant. Thank you very much. Brilliant. Thank you, Deborah. So, um, so I feel like actually one of the key things that we need to be doing now is to be telling the stories about the lower slopes of this mountain, the valleys and the uh, the lowlands that weight us down at the bottom here. What does the, what's the welcome like that awaits us here? What's the food like, the, the, the celebrations, the, uh, the, the welcome that awaits us there? How do we really bring to life for people uh, what that would be like so that we can create longing for that future? So, so much of my work I feel and the work that we need to be doing now around decarbonizing the world is around creating longing and that's a piece which is around storytelling that's a piece which is around imagination rather than just facts and figures uh, and policies and for the last 13 years of my life I've been really involved with the transition movement which has been about how do we start where we are now as communities what do we do uh, with the people the resources that we have how do we start not just to tell those stories in the places where we are, but give people a very tangible taste of what that future could be like. Uh, and that can be from small things like community gardens and planting trees, 
up to really, really ambitious things, some of which I'll be talking about shortly. So I spent the last couple of years focusing on this question of imagination because I kept reading people who I really admire, like Naomi Klein, Bill McKibben, who kept saying, climate change is a failure of the imagination. And, and it started to really get under my skin. I was thinking, why would we be having a failure of the imagination in 2020? And, and I've, come to, I've come to believe, and it's something that I set out in the book, that we have created a kind of a perfect storm of factors that are profoundly damaging to the human imagination. At the very worst time we could possibly do that. We know that the human imagination needs space, it needs, uh, it needs us to have our basic needs met and it has various needs which we are absolutely not meeting. We recognize that in a population, if it doesn't have a sufficiently good diet, we see a rise of otherwise preventable illnesses. We recognize that if we have a terrible education system, then a population fails to reach its full potential. But just slightly out of our field of vision, our collective imagination is kind of shrinking under this sort of uh, combined pressures. And, uh, and I feel like it's really important that we put it back right in the middle of our conversations and say, this is really, really fundamentally important. What I encounter quite a lot in the work that I do is people who say, oh, yeah, but that's never going to happen. And any of us who with with friends who say, hey, maybe we could do this. Maybe we could decarbonize by 2030. People go, yeah, probably too late anyway. And, you know, we encounter all of this. This is one of my favorite pictures from the US in the late 1960s when you could take your car and park it on the beach. If you went to the beach, you could park on the beach. And so there must have been a time when that changed. And people were told, actually, you can't park your car on the beach anymore because it'd be so much nicer for everybody. And there must have been people then who said, I can't imagine not being able to park my car on the beach. And we encounter that all the time. But we now know that actually not parking your car on the beach is actually great. And, uh, and so this thing of getting past that bit that goes, I just can't imagine, really, you know, this sort of poverty of imagination, because rapid change happens all the time. There are so many brilliant examples of change happening really, really fast. This is one of my favourite from the southwest of England in 1892, when over one weekend, over two full days, starting at 4am on Saturday, finishing at 4am on Monday, a team of 4,200 people laid 160 miles of new railway track. When we decide we're going to do something, we can move really fast and we can move mountains uh, metaphorically, if not literally. And part of that for me is, our, is, is that we need to be creating what I like to, to think of as memories of the future. How do we bring to life in people's imagining the kind of world that we create? The poet Rilke once said, the future must enter into you a long time before it happens, which is so beautiful. I'm going to say it again. The future must enter into you a long time before it happens. This is an artist called James Mackay who draws the future. He lives in Leeds and he draws places in Leeds as they might be in a post-carbon future. This is his drawing of, of Leeds if it became the most biodiverse city in the world. If we set out right now to say in 10 years time, Leeds is going to be the most biodiverse, bio, I can't even say that word, biodiverse city in the world. What would it look like? It would look like this. And how do we bring that multi-sensory imagining uh, alive for people? Many cities post-COVID are saying, how do we move beyond cars? If we were to do that and we were to get cars out of our cities and free up that space, what could we do instead? This is his drawing of, you know, take up the tarmac. You fill those streets with gardens. Our children walk to school past food being grown. All of this is absolutely possible within the next five years, never mind the next 10 years, if we are to create a sufficient longing for it. When Neil Armstrong set foot on the moon, it wasn't his idea. It wasn't JFK's idea in 1960. We had been going to the moon for decades before that in songs, in stories. Tintin went to the moon. Frank Sinatra sang us to the moon. By the time we got to 1960, the longing to get to the moon was so intense that it actually took eight years from scratch to work out how to get to the moon. And the average age of the team that got Neil Armstrong to the moon was 26. You know, when we decide to do something and the longing is sufficient, the thing happens. So what I want to share with you today is something which I hope you will find useful in your organizations, in your movement, in, in projects that you're involved with. It came about through a, a friend of mine called Rob Shorter, who was uh, a tenant in my house just when I finished writing the book. And he um, did his dissertation about the book. He had a manuscript of the book. 
and he uh, and he created this model, which is just brilliant, and he, which we which we kind of jointly created just after the book had gone to be printed. So that's why it's not in the book. But we call this the imagination sundial, and and uh, for me, it's an attempt to answer the question: What? How could we rebuild our collective imagination if we set out now and said? The, the, the deterioration of the collective imagination in this country has reached such a point that actually what we need to be doing is, is electing people who run on Make Britain Imaginative Again tickets. Uh, and, uh, and you decided that that was the key priority, where would you start? And there are four things, and I wanna go through each of those and tell you some stories. So the first one is space. We all know uh, in our lives, uh, possibly you guys more than a lot of people, that having space for reflection in our life is fundamentally important to us having being able to live an imaginative life. No one's best ideas came to them at five o'clock in the evening with an eight o'clock deadline sitting in front of their laptop. Albert Einstein always said his best ideas came when he rode his bicycle through the forest. Uh, and that space is disappearing so quickly out of our lives. The chief executive of Netflix recently said that their biggest competitor as a business was sleep. And we are seeing that space that we would otherwise spend daydreaming being eaten by overwork, by social media, uh, and, and its disappearance is really important. And movements like the transition movement, like Extinction Rebellion, I think are really good at designing space into how they work. So every meeting is not just colleagues coming together with an agenda, it's friends who care about each other meeting to support each other and designing space for celebration and for grief and for, and for whatever is, is a really important part of this. In the transition movement, we try and do that on a community scale. This is just before lockdown here in Totnes where we put on a big uh, community imagining event uh, and those things happen so rarely those kind of what if spaces are so precious where we come together well facilitated to say okay where do we go from here so creating space uh, is the first thing and I think we need to be looking at things like a universal basic income a four-day working week all as being part of a national imagination strategy how do we help to, to bring space back into people's lives and to recognize that that space is not equally divided and there's a profound social justice uh, aspect as we've seen during uh, COVID. The second one is place. And what I mean by place is places that you go where afterwards, when you go back to where you were before, you look at it in a new way. You see its possibilities in a different way. This is Waterloo Bridge. And my wife has been very, very involved in Extinction Rebellion. And uh, she was there on Waterloo Bridge for the whole two weeks uh, last April when Extinction Rebellion occupied that bridge. Blocked it at both ends and turned it into a forest. And uh, normally it's cars thundering backwards and forwards. For those two weeks, it was a forest with music. And many, many people who work and go backwards and forwards every day would just stop and say, oh, this is so beautiful. Why can't it always be like that? And after you've seen Waterloo Bridge uh, as a forest, it's very hard to unsee that. And it starts to change your sense, your expectation. This is in Paris, where there's a great transition group in the suburbs in Paris called uh, Pré Saint-Gervais en Transition, who is starting a campaign not against something, but for something. They want to create a new urban forest. They do big marches through the area demanding uh, a new urban forest, which they talk about as being a biodiversity strategy and an urban cooling strategy. I think it's also a really important imagination strategy. Bring forests back in places where don't expect it. It's just beautiful. Like the work of this Austrian artist who just creates forests in really crazy unexpected places like here in the middle of a football stadium. You know, creating these kind of pop-up things that start to shift our sense of how the future might be. This is uh, a guy called Jason Roberts in Houston, Texas. There's a project called Better Block. They go to places like this. Nobody loves this place. They talk to the people around. They say, what does this place need? What do you love here? And then they go back to their laboratory and they create stuff. And then one day they arrive at dusk and they work through the night and no one knows what they're doing. And the next day they've turned that place into this place and filled it with the kind of things that it could be in a more caring, more connected kind of a future. I like to think of it as being tomorrows, which is really uh, what they're creating. And that doesn't need to be always that big and ambitious. This is a, a thing that I love from um, the US started in San Francisco, a group of artists who got together to say, where can we find affordable exhibition space? Well, then somebody said, if you buy a ticket for a car parking space, is, do you have to put a car in it? Is there actually a rule or could you actually just curl up in it and go to sleep if you wanted to, as long as you'd bought a ticket? 
So they started an event called Parking Day, where everybody goes down one day and they all buy a parking ticket and they fill those spaces with people doing yoga, with people playing games. They start little cafes, little gardens, different organizations come down. It's just fabulous. People get married in them sometimes. They do this. I have no idea at all what this is, but actually it doesn't really matter. They, they, they take a space people know well and they turn it into something else that starts to shift your sense of how this space could be in the future. And um, also when we're talking about places, we have, I think, perfected the art of designing awful and boring spaces. And one of my favorite uh, people is a guy called Hundertwasser, who was a Swiss or Austrian, I think, artist and architect, who, who said, in former times, painters painted houses. Today's paint, today painters have to invent houses and the architects have to build after the painting because there are no beautiful houses anymore. And I think the, the, the ability for the buildings around us to enhance or to deplete our imagination is really important. This is a thing that he did uh, where he created the, 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 the cancer department at his local hospital uh, to take away all the corners and to turn it into somewhere completely different. This is the corridor that he created in the uh, in the cancer hospital this is an amazing development that he did which is just uh, in there are no corners in all of his buildings on the ground floor the floors undulate like this because he said when you go for a walk in the forest it's never flat it's not natural to have flat floors so the buildings all kind of undulate this is a house that he built in the middle of vienna called the hundertwasser house where he said every house should primarily be a forest uh, and a house second. And I think we so, so important need to be creating those places that we go to and, and it just changes us uh, on many, many levels. Sometimes those places can be whole towns, whole cities. This is in uh, France in a place called Ungersheim. One of the best examples of transition in practice I've ever been to. It's the place you go to where you can see how energy and food and local currency and local economy all weave together. And it's been featured uh, in a film which has been shown, shown all across France called What Are We Waiting For? These places, whether they're towns or cities, and, and with something that we try and do in Tonnes that people come here to learn about transition and then they go home and they look at the place they've come from in a very different way. These places are so important and precious. So place, and, and space are my first two. And my third one is practices. We need the practices that allow us to unlock uh, people's imagination. And we have to start with a recognition that we are not all on a level playing field. That uh, imagination to a degree is a function of privilege. When you are struggling and overwhelmed, it's very hard to live an imaginative life. This is part of your brain called the hippocampus, where your imagination fires from. And it's particularly vulnerable to cortisol, anxiety and stress. So when I was researching a book, I wanted to try and find a place where they were deliberately expanding the hippocampus, a kind of a campus for the hippocampus, uh, if you like. And I went to Dundee to visit an amazing project called Art Angel run by Rosalie Summerton here. They work with people with mental health problems, with uh, depression, with uh, overwhelm, by using art. They say, when you walk through the door here, you're not a patient or a client, you're an artist preparing work for an exhibition. Every year they put on an exhibition in the biggest gallery uh, in the city and I met spoke to so many people and you could see how their imagination was starting to sort of expand back out again and for me the most powerful uh, uh, sort of indicator of the work they were doing was uh, was that every year they do an, uh, an appraisal to see how well they're doing. They give the artist a piece of paper with two outlines of a human form. They say, fill the first one in to show how you felt before you came here. The second to show how you feel now you've been coming here for a while. And I looked through a pile of them. They were really moving. I just want to show you one that I think is kind of itself. And to me, this feels like what the shift to a low carbon future will feel like if we get it right. Um, you know, this is this is this is when we look at it holistic. This is really what we can create. So the first practice is that we need to recognise that a lot of people need a real leg up uh, in terms of imagination. We need to create those. This is a practice actually that the, the Bridget was part of the last time we did this called Transition Town Anywhere, where you take a big space between 100 and 400 people. You imagine that you're stepping into a future, not a utopia, but a future where we've done everything that we could possibly have done. And then you decide, then you think, well, what would, what would I be doing in that future? And then you meet other people who share that interest. And then together you literally build it. 
from cardboard and string and sticky tape and pens, you build a three dimensional living, breathing model of the future that you then spend the next three hours in trading in, celebrating in, connecting in, weaving in, whatever. It's the most phenomenal to be among 300 adults lost in a play world of their own creation is amazing. Last time we did it, these two young men here created a public transport system for transition to where this might look to you like a few cardboard boxes and a couple of chairs. They could tell you everything about this, the tickets, uh, everything about it, where it went, what it ran on. As I, as I say, Rilke said, the future must enter into you a long time before it happens. And exercises like this are so powerful. Storytelling is another practice we need to really master. This is a guy called Per Gronqvist who works for the Swedish government. His job title is Chief Storyteller. That's his role. And, and his job description is to bring to life uh, the day-to-day -day realities of living in a post-carbon future. We need so many more chief storytellers. We all need the capacity and expertise to become those storytellers. And one of the key practices I think that we need is the ability to ask really good what if questions. And in Liège in Belgium, they, uh, the transition group there five years ago, six years ago, came up with a brilliant what if question. They said, what if in a generation's time, the majority of food eaten in this city came from the land closest to this city? So beautiful. And I went there for a big event where they first asked this question and it was amazing. I went back last year and in that time they created this project called the, the, the Liège Food Belt and they have created 25 new cooperatives. They've raised 5 million euros of investment from local people. Uh, they started a vineyard, two, two vineyards, a brewery, which I had to go and visit. You know, we all have to make sacrifices. They started farm they started this shop called the small producers which did so well they now have four of them i met the mayor of the city he said this is now the story of our city our role is just to remove all of the obstacles to this happening but the beautiful thing for me is it's about they got the what if question right it was an invitation for people to look at the future in a different way with an invitation to step in and one of the things i've loved since the book came out is to see lots of communities who are starting to use what if as the narrative, as the framing for thinking, how do we move beyond COVID? How do we design for, for post-carbon future? This is in Northern Ireland, something that I'm supporting where they've created what they call a coalition of the unexpected who are using what if as the narrative to frame what comes next. In uh, 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 Bude in Cornwall, they've I did a talk for them recently and they created all these beautiful what if graphics for Bude. What if more school time was spent outside than inside? What if car parks became play parks? What if birdsong drowned out the traffic? What if, uh, 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 you know, I just, they're just fabulous. And as a way of really opening up different possibilities, what if there was a daily imagination lesson? And this was the last one they created, which I thought was so beautiful because it didn't even need to have all of the words. And it spoke to something which is a deeper kind of a longing uh, in us, I think. And in, in Sweden recently, the Green Party ran an advertising campaign. This is this means what if in Swedish, where they took photographs of things already happening in Switzerland, uh, in Sweden, sorry, with this uh, wording to say, yeah, what if this was actually what the future was? I love this one because it's not just about solar panels and carrots. It's about well-being and it's about creating such a different economy. And this was my favourite one, which I think is just beautiful. I'm aware my time is up almost, so I'm, I, and I'm just going to give my very, very last one of these, which is PAC, which might seem a weird word to use in relation to imagination. This woman here is called Gabriela Gomez Mont. She works for the mayor of Mexico City, where she has created with him a department which was conceived of as being a ministry of imagination, which sounds like something from a Harry Potter book. They actually have it in Mexico City, and their role is to look after the, the well-being of the imagination uh, of the city. And the idea of pacts came to me from Bologna, where in Bologna, the municipality created something called a civic imagination office. They have six of them all around the city in response to a kind of an ongoing decline of in involvement in democracy and, and, and civic things within the city. So they run big visioning exercises. And at the end, when they come up with an idea and the community come up with ideas, the municipality say, great idea. Let's make that a reality. Okay, uh, we can offer this, this and this. You can offer that and that, good. 
let's make a pact. And in the last five years in Bologna, they've made 500 pacts from small little things to really big things, taking old office blocks over and turning them into schools to train kids as classical musicians. For me, there is something so important in our society now where our imaginations on the rare occasions when they are invited are marginalized, ridiculed, sidelined, uh, that we actually, we need to meet it in the middle. If we, if we invite the imagination, we absolutely need to meet it in the middle uh, and create pacts. So that's what I wanted to share with you today. And, uh, and in a minute, when, when Bridget's talking, I'll put a link in here to an article I wrote about the sundial where you can download it and you can find out much, much more about it in practice. And I don't have time for that. If you want to find out anything else about me, robhopkins.net is where all of the interviews that I did for the book, you can find them there in full. Transitionnetwork.org is where you can find out what's happening in the transition movement near, near where you live. And I, uh, I run a podcast called From What If to What Next. The listeners and subscribers send in what if questions. I find the two best people to... You would be most welcome. So thank you so much for your attention.